Hello? Oh. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, Pastor Uriah is on vacation today, so it's going to be a little bit different. Me and Rose are going to do our best. <laughs> um, we'll start with our opening hymn. Um, Sanctuary 2164, The Faith We Sin Hymnal. The words will be on the screen. Please be seated. Um, does anyone have any announcements? Let's give everyone, give Jerry and Shirley a big welcome. Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. <coughs> You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep those words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as the sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. <clears throat> prayer for the Human Family, Book of Commons Prayer, page um, 815. <clears throat> oh God, you made us in your own... <clears throat> You made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which, of, which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite, the bond, unite us in the bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish 
your purposes on earth, that in your good times all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, now it's time for something you're all good at. It's time to pass the peace. Like, make sure anyone who wants social distancing to allow it, but go ahead. Sharing God's peace. Let this day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. May the peace of, of Christ fill you today and every day. Please turn to your neighbors to wave and share God's peace by saying, Peace be with you. if you're able. Please join us in our hymn, Amazing Grace, number 547.
Be seated. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 21, the message. If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guiding, guidance, be careful that you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people of distress, keep your eyes open and be quick with response. If you work with the disadvantage, disadvantages, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. <clears throat> Keep a smile on your face. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on to dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing the second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourself fueled, fueled in a flame. Be alert, servants of the master. Cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. <clears throat> Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. <clears throat> Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in, every in everyone. If you've got it in you, Get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. <clears throat> Our scripture tells us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch, or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. <clears throat> your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. Before reading your scripture says, I will invite you to stay seated. I will invite you to stay seated, but rise in your spirit, lengthen your spine, and open your heart to hear these words from Jesus. An expert in the, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit an eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbors as yourself. He said, And to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. Sermon, embodying love. <clears throat> Rev, Kelsey, Bibi. Today's sermon will be a video sermon. Grace and peace to you from the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen. The day that I sat down to write this message to you, I sat in a dark sanctuary with just a few candles lit, a little bit of light pouring in from the windows. And it would have been just a normal rainy Wednesday afternoon, except the day before, 
an 18-year-old gunman walked into an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas and took the lives of 19 beautiful, precious children and two beloved teachers. All of them children of God. And just 10 days before that, a young man steeped in white supremacy walked into a grocery store where the black community shops for their milk and for their Sunday dinner and took the lives of 10 of our black brothers and sisters, all of them children of God. We're here this weekend to talk about beloved community, what it means to be beloved community. But as I look out at the world, I can't help but wonder if it's possible. The vision that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King had for beloved community was one that was free of violence, free of hatred, racism, and prejudice, free of poverty, free of everything that divides and tears down, free of everything that brings death or destruction. It's a vision for a world that only builds up and lifts up, a world only of abundant life. And it's difficult to imagine for me today. I wonder if it's possible. As I look out at this world, I wonder, how are we supposed to have any semblance of hope? How are we to believe that things can get better, that things will change? How are we to believe that love has the final word when it feels like it doesn't? In the face of so much tragedy, I wonder, how do we have hope? How do we not lose hope? Jesus told his disciples before he died, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. But man, am I afraid. And I don't think I'm the only one whose heart is troubled by the state of the world. So many of us have cried out, How long, O oh Lord, where have you gone? God, where are you? Have you abandoned us? Sometimes I wonder if God looks down at us and asks us in return, where have you gone, beloved? How much longer will you tear each other apart, beloved? Have you abandoned one another? Thousands of years ago, Cain spilled his brother's blood and then asked the Lord, am I my brother's keeper? We know the answer to that question. I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. I am my sibling's keeper. But as we look out at the world, it feels like we've forgotten that. That simple lesson found the very beginning in Genesis. It feels like evil is winning. It feels like this beloved community that Dr. King envisioned is so far out of reach it's not even possible not even fathomable and so how do we hold on to hope in the face of so much awful tragedy how do we not lose hope to be honest with you i sat at this point in my sermon for a really long time because I don't have the answer. To be honest with you, I have a hard time holding on to hope in moments like this. But I suppose I find comfort in the fact that we've wrestled with this question for a really long time. All of our ancestors at some point, I am sure, have asked, God, where are you? Have you abandoned us? Even in scripture, Job wrestled with this question. The Israelites wrestled with this question when they were in exile. 
Where is God? Has God left us? Are we no longer God's people? It's all over the Psalms and lamentation, and even Jesus Christ himself asked, My God, why have you forsaken me? How do we have hope when we feel abandoned? How do we have hope when the world goes dark? On that rainy Wednesday afternoon, I looked up from my writing to see a dad bringing his two kids in those doors. We lit a few candles together and we said a prayer. And after they left, I sat and I looked at those candles they had just lit. And I thought about the words in the Gospel of John at the very beginning. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then I remembered where God is. God's in the dark with us. Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the darkest shadows, I fear no evil because you are with me. God is with us in the dark, reminding us that we are are the light. I hear an echo of Jesus' words, you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. As I look at these kids, it's easy for me to remember that God lives in each and every one of us. It's something we're told at our baptism. God looks at each and every one of us and calls us beloved. Before anything else, You are beloved. God's light and God's love is in each and every one of us. And that light lives on even in the dark. On Good Friday, we tried to snuff out Christ's light in this world. But it couldn't be snuffed out because it lives on in us. God brought forth the resurrection And the resurrection is continued through us and the way we love one another. In every act of love, especially the simple ones. That's God's love in the world, the light in the darkness. In Romans 12, which we read from today, Paul says we can overcome evil by doing good. He tells us, To not let evil get the best of us, but to get the best of evil by doing good. It reminds me of the slogan at my husband's first church, which was a coffee house ministry. On every coffee mug they had, it said, wake up, do good. So when we don't know what else to do, we do good in small, simple ways. And Romans 12 gives us a blueprint for how to do that. It says if you preach, just preach. If you're helping, don't take over. If you're guiding, be careful not to get too bossy. Hold on to what is good and love from the center of who you are. Practice playing second fiddle. Laugh with your friends who are happy and weep with those who are sad. Bless your enemies and be careful not to curse them under your breath. Make friends with nobodies and don't be the great somebody. If you see someone who's hungry, buy them lunch. If someone near you is thirsty, get them a bottle of water. You'll surprise them and probably yourself with your generosity. Discover beauty in everyone. Get the best of evil by doing good. This is what it means to live out our faith. This is what it means to live as beloved community. This is what it looks like to live out Christ's commandment that we read, to love God and love our neighbor as ourself.
In the book of Deuteronomy, which we read from today, it tells us that this commandment to love should be at the center of our lives. It should be what we think about when we lie down at night and when we rise up in the morning, in our coming and in our going. When we're sitting down at dinner, this is what you should be talking about. When you're going about your day, this should be on your mind. And tells us even to write it on our doorpost so that when we see it, as we're coming and going, we're reminded of how important it is. That is how much this should utterly and completely define our lives. The commandment to love. Then Christ gives us the echo of this commandment in all the Gospels when he says, You are to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and with all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I want you to imagine for a moment the shape of a cross. You probably don't have to imagine too much. There's one right behind me. But in the shape of a cross, you have two lines. You have the vertical line and the horizontal line. And we can embody this even in our own bodies. This vertical line is our relationship with God. And the horizontal line, if I were to extend out my arms, what does it look like I'm going to do? Like I'm about to invite someone into a hug. And so the horizontal line is love of neighbor. You can't have the shape of the cross without both lines. The vertical line, love of God, and the horizontal line, love of neighbor. And then I ask, where do those two lines converge? By your heart. You at the center, where God resides in you. You need all parts. Love of God, love of neighbor, and love of self. It is through us that God's love is embodied in the world. The light that we carry forth, that we are given as God's beloved children, each and every one of us, that light is shined through the world by each of us as Christ's hands and Christ's feet and Christ's heart in this world. When we are loving our neighbor, we are loving God. When we are loving ourselves, we are loving God. We cannot have one without the other. They are intricately woven together. And as we live out that love that is God coming into the world, God's light, you are the light of the world. My friends, our faith isn't something we just think about. Our faith isn't just what we learn in Sunday school. It's something we live. It's about how we live and how we experience God. Faith isn't just what we know, it's how we love. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said that beloved community requires a qualitative change in your soul, which would result in a quantitative change in your life. Qualitative change in your soul is what happens when you see God in others. When we can see God within us and within each person we meet. When we can see God in ourselves and in each other, it creates quantitative change in how we interact with one another and how we treat also ourselves. It changes how we live. An ancient mystic poet, Rumi, said, Your task is not to seek love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. When we find those barriers, those barriers that keep us from loving our neighbor, loving God, loving ourselves more fully, when we can break those down, that's what creates the qualitative change. Breaking those down allows us to see God and to love God. To see God even in the person we disagree with, even in the person whose culture is different from our own, we dismantle those barriers. That's the qualitative change. 
seeking all of those things that keep us from truly loving. And the barriers we truly need to dismantle are the barriers often embodied in ideas of racism, sexism, ageism, bigotry, homophobia, transphobia, anti-Semitism, all of these different things. They are barriers we have built up against one another that keep us from loving one another. When we can dismantle those, when we can lean into curiosity instead of judgment, when we can let one another in, that's when we can love God more fully. Loving God, loving neighbor, loving self. That's the qualitative change, and the result is the quantitative transformation in how we live with one another, how we care for one another, how we treat one another. And yes, also, it should transform the systems we have built in our world. When we see each and every person as a beloved child of God because we've broken down all those other barriers that keep us from seeing that, that's when real change happens. That's the quantitative change. The beloved community that Dr. King believed in is one that had no poverty, no violence, no bigotry, and no prejudice. He said those things would not be tolerated because international standards of human decency would not allow it. He said racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. I will add siblinghood. If we can find it within ourselves, that qualitative change, the result, is the answer to the prayer that we say almost every Sunday. Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are the answer to that prayer. We are. When we can answer that, that's what will save the world. I believe that this is possible because what I know for sure is that God has not given up on us yet. God continues to love us, and so we can try to continue to love one another as God first loved us. And when we do that, it has a ripple effect. And that ripple effect has power because love has power. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, we must discover the redemptive power of love. And when we do that, we will make of this old world a new world. Bishop Michael Curry stated that quote in his sermon at the royal wedding for Prince Harry and Meghan. And he added this, he said, there's power in love to lift up and liberate when nothing else will. There is power in love to lift up and liberate when nothing else will. He said, there is power in love to show us how to live. I firmly believe that Jesus didn't come to die, he came to live. Scripture tells us that God so loved the world that God sent Jesus not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So I know God hasn't given up on us yet. Jesus came to live according to Scripture so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Abundantly. When Jesus is asked in our scripture from today, Teacher, how might I have eternal life? His answer is that we are to love God and love our neighbors ourselves. And then he adds this. He says, do this and you will live. It's about having life abundantly here and now. It's not about eternal life. It's about life here all those things you do, all those barriers you put up, that doesn't bring life. 
do this and you will live. Do this and everyone can have abundant life. And so we try. We try in these big and small ways to love one another. And when things get hard, because they inevitably will, they always do, they already have, we remember that love isn't something just fluffy and feel good. Love is gritty and it is hard. And love is a choice and an inconvenient one at that. There's nothing convenient about loving our neighbor. It's a choice we get to make. When my husband and I were first dating, we were at his parents' house. We had gone on this huge, long road trip to meet all the different family members. We were living in California at the time, and he was about to move to Missouri, and so we made this big, long road trip up to Washington State to both sides to visit family. We had just spent time with my parents and now his parents, and we were going up to meet my grandfather. So you can imagine we were a little tired after a lot of time with family. But it was important to me, when he met my grandfather, to make a good impression. My husband picked out his shirt and put it on, and he said that's what he was going to wear. And I looked at him and I said, are you sure you want to wear that shirt? Which, of course, ended up in an argument. It was our first big tuffle together, and he left the room at one point just to get water, but I didn't know he was getting water. And I sat down feeling pretty defeated and embarrassed, feeling like I had just messed up the best thing that had happened to me. We hadn't been dating for very long, but I knew that I wanted to marry him. And I was worried that I just messed it all up because I had asked this question about a shirt. And he came back and he realized, he said, I'm so sorry, I was just getting water, but it looks like you felt like I abandoned you. And he sat down next to me and he said, I learned something from my favorite TV show that's really important. It's MASH, by the way. So there's this great scene when an older man is giving a younger man some advice. This younger man's in love. And he said, when things get hard, because they will, you have two choices. You can either leave or you can love harder. And when things get even more challenging, because they will, you have two choices. You can either leave or love harder. And when things get even more difficult, because they will, you still have two choices. You can either leave or you can love harder. My now husband looked at me and he said, I promise to always love harder. And my friends, we get to make that same choice as a community. We can either leave, we can continue to abandon one another, or we can love harder. The gritty kind of love that comes with accountability and difficult conversations and vulnerability, that's the choice. And when we can't, because sometimes we need to set boundaries. Sometimes we need to step away for our own well-being, for our own safety. Sometimes that is required. And when that is, we can trust that God will fill in the gaps. We can trust in that. Because God's promise to us is to always love harder. God's promise is to lean in. This is the whole story of all of Scripture. The Bible isn't a story about our faithfulness to God. The Bible is a story of God's faithfulness to us, to God's people. That in the face of chaos and calamity and war and disbelief and doubt and all sorts of injustices and breaking of covenant, God remains faithful to God's people. God does not ever abandon God's people. And my friends, we are God's people. All of us. And God has not abandoned us before, and God will not abandon us again, ever, because God never has. 
And I cling to that truth today. I cling to the truth of God's everlasting and redeeming love, that God chooses to love us today, no matter how messy we are, no matter how imperfect or complicated we are, God loves us. And so I will try not to abandon us either. No matter how hopeless I feel in the face of tragedy, if God can cling to hope, I can try to cling to hope as well. So whether I'm sitting in a sanctuary with a few candles lit, praying with some young children, or I'm out in the bright and messy world, I cling to the truth that Jesus tells us, the embodiment of God's promise of love. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It never has, and it never will. That is how we hold on to hope. Thanks be to God. Amen. Some of that was hard to hear, but there was a lot good. I always love that bit of Romans, because often when you read things in the Bible, you have to translate them to today. Like, what does that mean now? But that scripture always sounds to me like you could read that at a high school, to a high school graduate if you were giving them advice today. Just directly relates to now. But let's all join together in our Father's prayer. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen now is when we're going to gather the offering I would like to just remind everyone that in addition to the plates we have in the center, like we also can do offering online. Um, we have multiple ways to give, however works best for you. Generous, abundant, and precious to God, bless our offerings in a presence, ability, and resources as we participate in your co-creators. Please join us in the hymn, Creating God, Still, Creating Still, number 278. Please stand if you're able.
May the God of peace assure you. May the God of life invigorate you. May the God of wood direct you. Go in peace and hope to transform your community and the world to the glory of God. God, thank you for coming. You may now leave.